Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? All right. Uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. Um, today is 9-11. Uh, it is the 18th anniversary of the uh, attacks on our country. Uh, I personally lost five members of my neighborhood in the Pentagon air crash, so I hope everyone has taken the time to remember them and also keep them in your hearts and minds. Uh, the purpose of tonight's meeting, uh, we have been tasked with following through on the Congress's uh, Directive Act, uh, NEMA Act, Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act. I have been tasked, and my branch has been tasked with Section 108, which is to come up with the best practices for community advisory board, boards at decommissioning nuclear power plants. And that is the sole purpose of our meeting tonight. If you have other issues, we're not, we're not here to hear about those. So I'm sorry about that. I sympathize with, your, with the situation, but it's also in litigation, so we're not allowed to speak about it. So uh, with that, you know, it was decided by other people than the people that are here tonight from the NRC. So I appreciate it if you would stick to the topic that we're here for. Next slide, please. This is an NRC Category 3 meeting. Uh, like I said, it is a meeting to obtain comments to identify the best practices for the establishment and operation of local community advisory boards, commonly known as CABs. They're also known as NDCAPs, Nuclear Decommissioning Citizen Advisory Panels, uh, and a number of different names, Citizen Engagement Panels around the country. Uh, and it, there's four nuclear power plant power reactors and we're also going to include any lessons learned from the existing CAP. So that's another reason we're here tonight. Uh, we have certain meeting safety procedures. We know where the exits are over here. Uh, and so with that, uh, are there any NRC staff that would like to be introduced? I'm Trish Hollihan. I'm the director of the Division of Decommissioning Uranium Recovery and Waste Programs, and I'm happy to be here and listen to your thoughts and ideas, and I welcome you all. Hi, I'm Scott Wall. I'm with the Project Manager for Pilgrim for the uh, Nuclear Regular um, Reactor Regulation Office. Okay. Any others? No? Okay. Uh, my name is, again, is Bruce Watson. I'm chief of the reactor decommissioning branch. I've had the opportunity to speak not only at public meetings here on de reactor decommissioning in the past here, but also at NDCAP meetings. So uh, I'm back again. Uh, so we're here. I'm here with two of my staff members. On my right is Ted Smith. He's a project manager in the reactor decommissioning branch. And Kim Conway, she's also a project manager in my branch. Uh, they also, uh, I also have a number of other people in the working group that are working uh, to prov get the input from the public, hear your comments, so we can formulate the, the report to Congress next July. Uh, with that, uh, after we get done with the short uh, NRC presentation, I'm going to turn the, uh, the uh, meeting over to Brett. He'll be going over the ground rules. Uh, I do want to remind you that uh, Mr. Pete Holland's over here transcribing the meeting. And also, uh, we had a last-minute uh, uh, cancellation by the closed captioning people, the company that we had arranged over a week ago to be here. So I apologize for, for their poor performance, but there's really nothing I could do about it at 4 o'clock this afternoon. So with that, uh, we'll go to my presentation, please. Uh, just as a reminder, the NRC has uh, significant decommissioning experience. Uh, our regulations are, have been in place since 1997, and so we've had, we have extensive decommissioning experience in the providing licensing and inspection oversight of all the nation's uh, power reactors, research reactors, and complex material sites. A total of 10 power reactors have completed decommissioning, and uh, unfortunately, seven of those still have spent fuel on the facilities. So we continue to inspect those facilities each year. Uh, to inspect, ensure the spent fuel is safe. The other point I want to make is that out of the, almost these 80 uh, reactors, or excuse me, 80 complex sites that have had their licenses terminated, they have all been released for unrestricted use, meaning that the owner of the property can use the, the land for whatever purpose they suit to, suit to after they've met our criteria 
for license termination. And with that, since there are, are, are uh, release for unrestricted release, and that's their intent, there is no requirement in the NRC regulations for us to hold a citizen's advisory panel, uh, for us to require a citizen's advisory panel to be uh, at the sites. So all citizen's advisory panels are voluntary. Uh, they're either supported by other, other groups, but we are not uh, party to them. We will come and talk at them, but when invited, uh, as we have in the past, but we do not require that they exist. So uh, keep that in mind as, as we talk tonight. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the Yankee Row Nuclear Power Plant. The license was terminated in 2007. It still has its spent fuel facility on site, so we continue to inspect that. The, uh, a member of the Yankee Row Citizens Advisory Panel uh, was at our meeting last night in Vermont and provided some input on their Citizens Advisory Panel. Next uh, slide is the Worcester Polytechnic Research Reactor. This was decommissioned and the license was terminated in 2013. So just here in the state, we've done at least two large projects uh, in reactor area. Next slide, please. On January 24th, uh, Congress uh, issued the legislation uh, for the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act. We call it NEMA. And specifically, as I said, Section 108 was assigned to my branch. And it says in there that this co the commission, meaning the NRC, shall submit to Congress a report identifying the best practices with respect to the establishment and operation of a local community advisory board to foster communication and information exchange between a licensee planning for and involved in decommissioning activities and members of the community that decommissioning activities may affect, including lessons learned from any such board in existence. So we would like your comments uh, by November 15th, so you have some time to think about them. Uh, we do have a questionnaire that's out, out on the table. Uh, we also have uh, this card out there, which has the information, uh, which we'll be going into a slide later on how to send in by either using our website, uh, regulations.gov website, or by letter or by email. Next slide, please. So what are community advisory boards? They're an organized group of citizens interested in safety commissioning practices and spent fuel management at a decommissioning facility. The sponsor is usually a, the local licensee or mandated by state legislature. Composition typically includes local community leaders and elected officials, state representatives, and members of a licensee staff. Most CABs are, have a governing charter to establish roles and responsibilities. Next slide, please. What are the typical CAB responsibilities? They review licensees' plans for decommissioning. They provide insights into potential impact on the local community. There's an opportunity for public education on decommissioning, and they can provide, make recommendations to state officials. They provide input on uh, site, can provide input on site restoration, plans for future reuse of the site, and possibly economic development. Next slide, please. So what is our report to Congress going to contain? It's going to decane a, a CAB discussion topics, CAB recommendations to form decision-making processes during decommissioning, CAB interactions with the Commission, and other federal regulatory bodies to support the board members' overall understanding of the decommissioning process and promote dialogue between the affected stakeholders and the licensee involved in decommissioning activities. How a CAB could offer opportunities for public engagement through all phases of the decommissioning process. Next slide, please. So, the report will con also continue the CAB membership composition, selection process, and the terms of that membership. When the, CAB when the CAB was established and the frequency of CAB meetings and any specific logistics required to support the CAB activities and other identified best practices or activities. And uh, like I said, these are captured, these questions are captured in a questionnaire we have out front. It's available on our website. It was cleared by the Office of Management Budget to provide that, that questionnaire to you. Next slide, please. So the methods to, com to submit comments, public comments uh, you provide us here tonight, like I said, will be transcribed and we will be looking at those 
again when we get the transcription back as well as my staff taking notes tonight on your comments you, you, you give to us tonight. We'll be taking some notes. Um, the, you can fill out the NEMA questionnaire and you can do it online at this website. Uh, you can submit the comments electronically to the federal rulemaking website which is regulations.gov under this NRC docket number here. We're going to put this slide back up because it's a lot of information later. Uh, you can scan the que completed questionnaires and send them to NEMA 108 resource at NRC, which is our email address, or you can mail the questionnaires to Kim Conway here, who's got a large mailbox waiting for all the comments. Next, next page, next slide, please. Uh, the NEMA section 108 webpage is easy to get to. You can go to nrc.gov for our public website, and there's a section there called Spotlight which I've got circled here on the slide. On the left-hand side, you can click on the uh, community act, uh, advisory, uh, I can't read this here, but it's the uh, community, advisory community advisory board meetings, and uh, get your information, that'll take you right to the website. Next slide, please. So, for further information, you can send, uh, send an email or call Dr. Uh, Dave McIntyre from our Office of Public Affairs at NRC headquarters. And of course, you can email our NEMA 108 resource at uh, .gov uh, email address. Next slide, please. Just to summarize, uh, our whole intent of this meeting tonight is to discuss the uh, NEMA Section 8, 108 requirements that were placed upon us by the Congress. Uh, we're going to be uh, taking your comments, listening, and uh, collecting those uh, from this meeting and 10 other uh, meetings around the country. This is actually meeting number six. So uh, we hope to get your comments as well as the ones that we've received recently and also the ones in the next, in the few coming weeks. Uh, so I, uh, I know you have a number of issues you're passionate about, but unfortunately we're not here to talk about those tonight. Uh, so. With that, I'll turn it over to Brett Klugen, our uh, facilitator. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> hello, everyone. Um, just, just some basic ground rules. Many of you who have come to meetings uh, before uh, for the NRC um, or hosted by the NRC have heard these already. But I, I feel like it's important that I, you know, be very clear up front. I play by a three strikes rule. Three instances after the third instance of disruptive behavior, I will ask you to leave the meeting. Um, and then as to this next point, let me be very, very clear. Well, I have no expectation at all that this will occur tonight. Um, under no circumstances will threatening gestures or statements be tolerated in any way. If you engage in such behaviors, you will be immediately ejected from the meeting room. If you refuse to leave, local law enforcement will escort you out. All right. Um, with that, if you've been, if you feel that you've been threatened, um, please let me know or please let one of the other officers know or another NRC member you see wearing one of the name tags in the room. I just want to be very clear on that point. All right, uh, next up, the uh, tickets, so, or the order of speakers. Um, as we've done in past meetings, we're using a ticketing system tonight. Uh, when you registered to speak, you should have received one half of a ticket, the other half went into a collection container. Um, the purpose of which is to randomize the order of speakers. So during the public comment portion, I will pull numbers from that. That will determine the order of speakers. Um, when we get to the public official or the elected official comment portion, I'll go out and see how many people we have, and based upon that, I'll figure out how how much time we can allot to each speaker, but at a minimum you will get three minutes. You may get more depending upon the number of speakers we have signed up. I'll divide it up accordingly depending upon how much time we have remaining. Um, you are free to donate tickets amongst yourselves. I ask that you try to figure that out in advance so we don't spend time during the meeting trying to um, do little auctions of who gets to speak next using what ticket. Um, again, my hope is that everyone will have an opportunity to speak tonight, so hopefully you won't need to donate your tickets around. Uh, I would point out that um, unless we get to a second round of comments, people will be limited to one time at the microphone. Um, so you can't use another ticket to speak again until we get to everyone has already had an opportunity to speak, just so we give everyone a chance at the microphone who came here tonight with a desire to offer comments. Um, for your awareness, as was already mentioned, the meeting tonight is being transcribed. So when you get to the microphone and it's your turn to speak, I ask that you please state your name and then spell it if you wouldn't mind. Um, and then also provide any organization with whom you are affiliated or for whom you are providing comments. 
Um, I will have a countdown clock, or the countdown clock is positioned in front of the microphone. Again, I will determine the amount of time once we get to the public comment portion. Uh, that will count down um, to zero, just so you know how much time you have left. Um, and then I just want to echo what Bruce said. Look, I recognize, I've been here many times with you, and the, the reason I come here is to, um, and I, you've heard me say this before, so I'll be very brief, is because I, to be, I believe in this dialogue between the public and the NRC, and I want to do my best to encourage it and to make this as worthwhile for you as possible. Now, I recognize, with that said, that many of you have come tonight um, with feelings about the license transfer, that you are angry, you are furious about it. I'm not here to dispute that, all right? The question is, is what you do with this meeting. Congress set this meeting up to give you an opportunity to provide comments on how a cab should be organized. And I can't, as a facilitator, there are many actions I can take. I can kick people out of the room. I have no intention of doing that. I can do certain other actions, but I can't force you to talk, stay on topic. Like, that's up to you. So it's a question, it's a choice you have to make on what you want this meeting to be. This is your opportunity to provide comments to us and ultimately to Congress on what you think CAB should be, how they should be funded, what should be their responsibilities, and then what should be their organization, who should be on them. So it's, this is your opportunity to provide that, as well as written comments afterwards. So I leave it up to you to choose how you use this meeting. Again, I'm not going to cut people off, but I just want to ask that you think about what's the best use of your time here. And I'm not trying to tell you what that is. I'm just asking you to take that into consideration. Um, and with that, uh, before we turn to elected officials, I just want to make sure, are there anyone, does anyone have any comments on the NEMA process? This is, again, just on Section 108, how the, the, what we're doing with these meetings, how we're collecting comments. Anyone have a question on that in particular? All right, hearing none, uh, we will turn to elected officials. First, I'd like to call up uh, Jim Cantwell on behalf of Senator Markey. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Jim Cantwell. I'm the State Director for United States Senator Ed Markey. I'm here first. I want to thank uh, State Senator Vinnie DiMacito. I want to thank State Senator Dan Wolf for their great work in the Massachusetts legis legislature creating the NDCAP. They worked very hard to make sure that there would be a public process. We're very disappointed in, in thus far to know that, that the, the results of this process have not been listened to. I want to thank Sean Mullen, the chair, and all the NDCAP members. There were over 21 formal meetings, over three hours apiece. There were numerous subcommittee meetings, thousands of hours of individuals to try to make sure that, that this transfer process and the decommissioning would be done properly. I applaud the governor's office, by the way, Republican governor along with a Democratic attorney general who worked hard to make sure that we set up an interagency working group that would be able to, to make sure that they would uh, represent and protect the public's interests. The first thing I want to take away from knowing when you think best practices, this was the best practice. And when you have every political persuasion, every citizen's group, I, I want to note Pixie Lampert here, Jim Lampert, the great work of Pilgrim Watch, all citizens' groups that have come together with a unanimous voice about some concerns with this transfer that went on deaf ears. On behalf of, of Senator Markey, I have a written statement that I want to give, but I want to note first that, that based upon the inability or the refusal of the NRC to listen to these folks. NRC no longer stands for Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It's now saying you are no longer not recognizing citizen input. And I, and I want to note, <laughs> I'll read into the record the, the Senator's comments. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff are here to look at best practices and lessons learned in how community advisory boards can help to affect nuclear decommissioning activities. But the lesson learned here is clear. Despite promising to listen to local stakeholders, their opinions were ignored. They were cut out at every single turn. The Pilgrim Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel, NDCAP, has done a, a tremendous job. 
Indeed, they took uh, in its role of community advocates and liaisons very seriously. For two years, members of the NDCAP fulfilled their legislative duty holding regular meetings. I mentioned the 21 full meetings, but also working day in and day out to gather community concerns to ensure the people of Massachusetts are well represented and protected. The panel has repeatedly raised concerns over the use of decommissioning trust funds the desire to have a 10 milliram radiation standard, not what the federal standard would be, the safety uh, of communities within the 10 mile emergency uh, pr protection zone, concerns about what you've already started to, to do, which is not to allow funds to go to the surrounding communities even while this waste is being transferred, and the cost of emergency preparedness. The NRC did not address a single one of these concerns before allowing the transfer. Entergy, Entergy did not address a single one of these concerns. And Holtec has not addressed a single one of these concerns through the process. It's hard to take the NRC's search for best practices seriously tonight when our community members too often saw the worst of government bureaucracy and corporate indifference throughout this process. When we needed reassurance and responses, we got delayed and denials. Pilgrim's decommissioning should not have had this canary in a coal mine for the NRC to realize that it needs to do much more to ensure that stakeholders are heard throughout the decommissioning process. The best practice would have been to have listened to NDCAP when it first convened two years ago, or at any point throughout the process, or at any time moving forward. The Pilgrim Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel is made up of bright, passionate public servants. This panel cares deeply about the community. They deserve to be listened to, not brushed aside, or to be pushed out. In summary, the Senator would like you to know that, that as a member of the United States Senate, feeling that these people have been disregarded and, and not listened to, He'll be calling for U.S. Senate hearings and will be joining with our others to make sure that we have some review process of the nuclear NRC not doing its job before allowing this transfer to be done. We thank you for the opportunity to be heard and look forward to hearing from others tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we will have um, Ms. Hannah Benson of uh, Senator Warren's office. Hi, thank you very much. As they said, um, my name is Hannah Benson, and I have a short statement here from Senator Warren. Senator Warren believes that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's handling of the Pilgrim Power Station jeopardized the health and well being of Massachusetts res residents. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission's decision to grant the license transfer from Entergy to Holtec without appropriately considering input from the people of southeastern Massachusetts is deeply troubling, especially given Holtec's plans to decommission the site on a much more rapid timeline than previously announced. Furthermore, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission should reject Holtec's request for an emergency preparedness exemption and instead ensure that Pilgrim develops and maintains emergency procedures that could prevent or respond to potential future disasters. It is unfortunate that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission came to Pilgrim to discuss best practices with the community advisory boards, but remains unwilling to change its behavior to assuage residents' concerns. Senator Warren will continue advocating on behalf of her constituents and holding federal agencies accountable for putting the safety of Massachusetts residents at risk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll have Mr. Michael Jackman um, on behalf of Congressman Keating. Thank you. I just want to uh, thank the NRC for including Plymouth, the original list for uh, public hearings uh, on this topic did not include Plymouth. And through the uh, advocacy of Congressman Keating and our Senate colleagues, we were able to get Plymouth included. So we appreciate that. Um, a letter that the Congressman has written to the Chair of the NRC. I write today to express my support for the incorporation of public input into the Commission's decision-making process, especially during the decommissioning of a nuclear power plant. Under the Nuclear Ener Energy Innovation and Modernization Act, the NRC is required to consult with stakeholders and report to Congress on best practices for community advisory boards in areas surrounding nuclear power plants that have ceased operations and begun decommissioning. In anticipation of the announced cessation of power generation operations at Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts established the Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel, NDCAP, in 2016. 
NDCAP has had an important role in discussing the impacts of decommissioning on local communities and residents and has am amassed a large body of fact-based information through its hearing process. NDCAP has conducted its meetings with transparency and with fairness to all parties, including the licensee. By inviting the testimony of stakeholders from residents, from environmental regu regulators, from local businesses, and from other states dealing with decommissioning process, NDCAP has developed recommendations geared towards maintaining public safety and environmental integrity. The NDCAP process has also allowed for a full airing of concerns by the host community as well as activist groups concerned about a range of issues, including radiological testing, water and air quality monitoring, and support for emergency planning resources. For the, la for the last year or so, these discussions occurred with the pending possibility of a license transfer that would allot responsibility for the decommissioning of Pilgrim to Holtec DCI LLC. This pending license transfer shaped the discussion and afforded the participants the opportunity to share concerns regarding the inexperience of Holtec and its partners in the decommissioning process. Despite concerns expressed by NDCAP members and by the community at NDCAP meetings, the NRC moved rapidly ahead to approve the license transfer last month. The NRC did so despite Holtec's refusal to enter into discussions with the Commonwealth or with the host community regarding its commitments to environmental protection, emergency planning support, and site redevelopment. In addition, the NRC approved the transfer absent a full hearing of the contentions filed by the Massachusetts Attorney General and Pilgrim Watch regarding Holtec's financial integrity and its ability to finance a complete decommissioning of the plant without taxpayer support. This chain of events demonstrates the need to give citizens advisory boards a more meaningful role in the decommissioning process. I have co-sponsored with Representative Welch of Vermont the Nuclear Plant Decommissioning Act of 2019, which would require the licensee to consult with affected states and localities before submitting a post-shutdown decommissioning activities report, PSDAR. It would also require the NR NRC to solicit public comment on the PSDAR, hold at least two public hearings, and invite the state to register its support or non-support the, for the proposed PSDAR, as well as to make specific recommendations to approve the PSDAR. This will give the host community and host state greater oversight of the decommissioning process and require the licensee to work with the affected communities to develop a safer, more effective decommissioning plan. As I work in Congress to effectuate this change, I urge the NRC to review its own regulations and policies to allow greater and more meaningful input from the public in its deliberations around decommissioning plans. The public must not be shut out of these discussions as it unfortunately has been here in Plymouth. Across the country, more and more nuclear plants, plants will undergo decommissioning in the years ahead. The NRC has the opportunity to learn significant lessons from its experience with Pilgrim's decommissioning and license transfer. I urge the Commission to take steps to ensure local public input is considered fully and incorporated into its decision-making processes, signed Congressman Bill Keating. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other uh, representatives on behalf of federal offices um, who would like to speak this evening? Okay. Um, next, we will have um, uh, State Senator uh, Vinny uh, DiMasio, um, please. DiMasito, apologize. Thank you. My name is Vinny DiMacito. I'm the state senator from the Plymouth and Barnstable District. Um, I would like to thank Congress for uh, giving us an opportunity to speak about the, uh, the NDCAP and how the best practices go forth. Um, as, as you heard earlier, uh, I, along with my colleague uh, Dan Wolf uh, and Re Representative Muratori, worked together to create this N uh, NDCAP because we felt it was very important. We learned from uh, and this, uh, that from people in Vermont that they did this and it was important that we have these tools early on. Uh, and so we did it and I would like to thank uh, the members of the NDCAP because I was thoroughly impressed over the years 
over the few years that they have met and they have spent time and really educated the community and the Commonwealth of what uh, would happen when this plant was decommissioned. Uh, I stand here to tell you how concerned I am about my disappointment in regards to the way that the uh, uh, NRC dealt with us through this process. I tried to be reasonable. I tried to share my concerns. Uh, not too long ago, I had a meeting uh, along with my colleagues at the state and local level, uh, state, local, and federal level to ask the NRC in regards to some concerns that we had uh, in regards to uh, the, the trust fund and how that process would go and, and, and giving us an explanation. I was told by the NRC at that time, as along with my colleagues, you need to put that writing, that, that request in writing, and we will get you this information. Of course, that information was in regards to um, what would happen if there was not enough money in the trust fund to finish, and who would be liable? Would it be the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? Would it be the town of Plymouth? Would it be the licensee? A pretty simple question, I believe. Uh, probably about a month and a half later, I received a letter telling me from the NRC, uh, thank you for writing this letter, but I'm sorry we can't answer that question because there's been a request to intervene and for a hearing a license transfer amendment application for the Pilgrim plant, and we have to be impartial, so we can't answer the question. However, you told me to write you a letter, and now I get a letter back. Um, this is just another example of um, how disappointed we are with the process. So I say this to really make this, this message clear to Congress, because I, I hope that everything that is being said here is going back to Congress so that people around the country will understand how, despite the goodwill and efforts of local communities, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, bipartisan delegation, to try to get to a common sense answers, because guess what? At the end of the day, we are a de facto spent fuel repository for nuclear waste. And that is just a reality. And I'm simply asking, how is it that we know that we're protected? And I know I'm getting cut off in a second. However, I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to say that that is not fair. And I do not, I do not believe that the NRC was fair in dealing with us through this process. Uh, they should have taken uh, the time to have listened to a greater degree to the community, to the attorney general, to the governor, Everyone was concerned about this, and you still just moved forward, and it really didn't matter what we thought. And that's disappointing, because you're a federal agency. You work for the, for the people of the country, just as we do. I'm only here advocating on behalf of my constituents that are concerned, because I'll be gone by the time that this could be a, you know, a, a problem, to, you know, 15, 20 years from now. But you know, my children and my children's children will be here, and so aren't everyone else's, and those spent fuel rods will still be here, and we don't know how it's all going to play out. We're just asking for answers. That was a simple question that we asked, and the NRC just basically said, we're not answering you at all. I just think that that's just irresponsible, and I'm disappointed uh, in the NRC. So I hope Congress gives communities and the, com and the states more power to require responses from the NRC in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before we turn to, to local officials and the NDCAP members, uh, I just want to make sure, are there any other um, elected officials um, from the state of Massachusetts or from uh, state level offices who would like to offer uh, comments at this time? did sign up. I, I'm, Am I, I being ignored on purpose? No, I, what, what's part your name, of the process? sir? No, what, what's your name, sir? I'm Matt Miratori, State Rep for Plymouth. So you wrote down no for preparing remarks. I don't have prepared remarks. I'm going to talk from the heart. That's what I meant by it. Okay. First of all, thank you for coming here. And every time where I was a selectman or a state rep, I've always welcomed you here, and I appreciate that. Uh, just a little bit of background, I became an uh, elected official in 2010 as a selectman, very proud of that, became chairman in 2012, and I invited the NRC to a meeting we had. And it was, it was a meeting to have open, honest discussions and to have the public be involved as well. And on our, on our side, we felt the meeting went well, but the feedback we got from you, that didn't go well. 
I'm a, I'm a very optimistic person. So I said, okay, we'll take lessons from that, we'll keep learning. Uh, I was fortunate to be elected state rep in 2014. So still involved with this whole process as a state rep now. And I was still optimistic up until recently. And it's disappointing that as a, as a representative of this community, as, as, a, as a family man, a father of six daughters, with grandchildren that will be coming on the way, that, th that they see what this is going to become. As the senator said, and he said it well, you know, this is becoming a, uh, a de facto site for us. And, and what's disappointing and what's, what's, what's hard to get by, well, first of all, let me say this. I, I, was, I was curious why you were coming because of the timing of all this. And then I realized from your opening comments why. You, it sounds like you really don't even want to be here, but Congress is telling you to be here. So I think with that, I think hopefully this is going to help. I'm still going to try to be optimistic and that you're going to hear from all of us, from all these people here, from Pilgrim Watch, from the Attorney General, from the federal, from the federal delegation. The process has to change. Now, you, you are very good at listening. I know that firsthand. You're very good at communication. But the substance isn't there. And I think what needs to change, and I'll wrap it up, I think what really needs to change at this point, and this is the lesson that I learned from this the last couple of months, is you, you really need to at least fake it. <laughs> at least fake the fact that you've got an attorney general, well respected by both parties in this commonwealth, that filed a motion to ask for you at least to hear her out. You had Pilgrim Watch send a motion to at least hear you out. You could have at least had the hearings. And I think that's the lesson I want to bring back to Congress, is don't close a loop on anything you decide to do until you hear everyone out. Yes, do they need to be put in writing? Sure they do. But at least fake it. Thank you. And again, I, my intent was not to reject anyone. I just interpreted the no and prepared remarks as you didn't want to stand to be recognized. My, my apologies again. Um, so uh, moving on, just to make sure, are there any other state-level representatives who would like to, even just to stand and be recognized at this time, we'll gladly bring a microphone to you. Okay, hearing none, we will move on to local officials. Um, we will first start with uh, Ken uh, Suarez. Chair of the Board of the Plymouth Selectmen. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ken Tavares, the Chair of the Plymouth Board of Selectmen. Uh, I've gotten to know a number of you uh, over the, uh, well, I, I should say I started this game back in the 70s, uh, so I've seen some of you for a good number of, of, of years. But I have to uh, be very sincere with you tonight and to tell you that I am extremely disappointed. Um, when I first looked at the call to this meeting, I wondered why, uh, you know, what happened in Plymouth is done. And I'm, I feel extremely, on behalf of my community, let down. I asked a number of our citizens to work on, on our handicap uh, committee and uh, they have put in countless hours. I've been to uh, many of their meetings, and I, and I know that they have uh, put in the hours with a great deal of passion and concern for our community as, as well as the surrounding communities, but nothing has happened. And this uh, road that we've been on since the 70s is disappointing. I, I went uh, a number of years ago to uh, Yucca Mountain I was invited to go on a tour and see the mark and see the mountain. So I went with the town manager at the time and one of my other colleagues. We took a tour and we actually went through around. I looked like a Disney uh, uh, ride to me at first. But when we came out, the person that was our guide said, this place will never see any fuel uh, put in, in, into that mountain. I thought, you have to be kidding me. That was a promise that the federal government made you know, to, to all of us, and it, and it was broken. I feel 
that you're all good men and women. I, I, don't, I don't doubt that. But I feel your hands are tied, and I'm trying to figure out where are they tied. I don't think you have the freedom to speak as clearly as you do, and it was demonstrated you know, just recently in Plymouth. Asking for time, asking for, for additional consideration, went by the board. And, it, and, it, and it, it just shocked me that people on the federal level could do that to us. And you know, going back to the community, we're beginning anew. We have a nuclear plant here. We have spent fuel here. And as uh, previous speakers have said, we have to deal with it. So the road is not over for us. But boy, I'll, 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 I'll tell you, my respect for the federal government, for the Congress right now, and the rules that we're, you know, that we're actually governed by right now scare the living daylights out of me. I don't think we're out of the woods, and I, I'm hoping that word will get back to the right people at the right time, that we all need help, and that this process has to change. It's not working, gentlemen. I know you've tried hard, but it's not working. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before I turn to members of the, the various uh, nuclear advisory uh, boards and commissions that have signed up to speak, I just want are there any other local elected officials um, who would like to stand and be recognized or to offer prepared remarks at this time? So again, we will next turn to the nuclear advisory commissions and panels, or members. Any other local elected officials? Again, my intent is not to exclude anyone. Okay, so um, I will go. I do have a list of people who have signed up, and then then I'll open it up to other NDCAP members. Um, so first we have um, Sean. Excuse me, I apologize. Sean Mullen, uh, the NDCAP chair, chairperson. Hi, my name is Sean Mullen, and I'm the chair for this year of the NDCAP here in Plymouth. Mr. Watson, other representatives of the NRC, welcome back to Plymouth. We're glad you came. Thank you for including Plymouth and Pilgrim in your efforts to identify the best practices and lessons we have learned from the creation and operation of the Commonwealth's Nuclear Decommission Citizens Advisory Panel, or NDCAP. While I truly appreciate your presence, and I'm sure you fully expect and understand the reasons for the anger and the outrage you'll hear tonight, please know that it's not directed to you personally, if you, as you've heard, but to the ongoing actions, or in way too many cases, the inaction of the organization you work for and represent, as well as the Congress and the other agencies of the federal government. Many of the citizens you'll hear from tonight feel this way because the lessons they've learned over the past five decades, including the current license transfer and decommissioning process. As chair of the NDCAP, I'm gonna share some very specific observations and lessons learned and offer some equally specific suggestions for the Congress, other states, other host communities in the NRC to consider as these many additional locations and facilities go through this same process in the future. I hope with your help and with Congress's efforts, they don't go through what we've been through. These are my own observations, opinions and conclusions. They don't necessarily reflect the thoughts of other members of the NDCAP of the public. I hope you'll hear them tonight as well. But before I get into the details, let me summarize my observations lessons learned and conclusions. The system, the entire system, the regulations, the policies, the practices are rigged in favor of the nuclear power industry. As I'll describe, the outcome of the license transfer, decommissioning, and exemption approvals was known to the companies involved well before the decision was made, almost down to the exact date. That is the very definition of the word rigged. As a result, I can only conclude that the NRC's process and decision on the license transfer and decommissioning approval 
has been nothing short of a travesty and a sham. With all due respect to your personal intentions and professional experience and integrity, which are not in question here tonight and have never been, this evening's meeting and this process are a costly charade. You know it's true. We know it's true. You're here because Section 108 of the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act, NEMA, requires the NRC to develop a report identifying best practice for the establishment and operation of local community advisory boards, CABs, associated with decommissioning. We're here, all of us, not because we have any confidence that our opinions based on past practices will change anything, because, but we're here because we can't be silent when what is wrong is so clear. Without strong action, and you heard some of it coming tonight, this dangerous farce will continue until a disaster occurs. And that is particularly noteworthy on September 11th. I hope I'm wrong. I hope your findings and report convince Congress to act. But I'm pessimistic because in some cases, past performance is, in fact, a very good indicator of future performance. That said, here are my personal lessons learned and best practices. I've organized my thoughts by the purpose, creation, composition, role, and governance of citizens' advisory boards. Let's start with the purpose. As the name states, these are citizens' advisory boards, advisory being the key word. Advisory is not authority. Advice can be considered or ignored by those who have the power and the authority to make decisions. In our case, our advice was considered by the Commonwealth and was ignored by the companies involved in the NRC. I would urge every other state to create a citizen's decommissioning authority, not an advisory board. <laughs> Average citizens who live in the impacted communities have more, should have more than just an advisory role. They should have a voice. Now on to the composition. I learned that the nuclear industry's money, power, and influence extends far beyond Washington, D.C., Rockville, Maryland, and in Plymouth's case, King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. I learned that the industry's highly paid lobbyists are just as effective on Beacon Hill as they are on Capitol Hill. This is a very important lesson for every state and every host community because the industry's lobbyists and their locally hired mouthpieces can permanently undermine and pervert every citizen's advisory board before it even gets started. Let me give you an example. Here in Massachusetts, the bill that created the handicap, we have the sponsors, co-sponsors of it here with Senator DiMasito and Senator Wolf. That bill mysteriously changed at the last minute, altering the original language and composition of the panel. These changes ensured that the citizen appointees to the panel were unable, even when they voted unanimously to support a motion, to gain the required majority vote without the support of the appointees of the plant operator and the ex officio appointees on the board. <coughs> Excuse me. This still unexplained change to the legislation effectively stacked the panel and muted the collected voices of the citizens, members, and the public. It was a disgrace. If other states and communities use legislation to create their advisory panel, they need to ensure that the industry and its lobbyists are not allowed to subvert the citizens' efforts before the process even begins. In addition, I learned that reasonable and su sufficient financial support and resources are needed to effectively operate the citizens' advisory panel. The volume and complexity of the issues involved require financial and human resource resources and expertise beyond the hundreds of hours citizen volunteers, other advocacy groups such as Pilgrim Watch, no matter how committed, can realistically devote to this effort. When you compare these limitations to the ratepayer funded deep pockets of the industry, the need for a true regulatory agency becomes even more apparent. Keep in mind, every dollar that was spent against 
proposals made by the NDCAP, by Pilgrim Watch, by the Attorney General, every dollar came from ratepayer money. The role. I also learned that the existing open meeting laws unintentionally but effectively curtail the role of citizen advisory boards by limiting the open and transparent discussions they were meant to ensure. Massachusetts open meeting laws require, their requirements rather, unintentionally distorted the role of the handicap by placing unnecessary, questionable, and obviously very counterproductive restrictions on open discussions among panel members. While the members of the panel who represented the license holder and the operator and the successor were free to discuss and deliberate the license transfer and the decommissioning issues with their management in private, and the ex officio state employees could meet, discuss, deliberate, strategize in private meetings, the citizens panel was strictly prohibited from doing so. This severely undermined the effectiveness of the handicap because, among other things, it meant the plant's operator had to be involved in every group conversation. Absurd. Nothing short of absurd. This had a chilling and damaging effect on the panel's ability to discuss and deliberate critical decommissioning issues. For example, the handicap here in the Commonwealth was prohibited from learning the details of or participating in any meetings, discussions, and negotiations between the state and the plant's owner or the decommissioning successor. This effectively limited the citizens panel from participating in precisely what it was created to do, advise the governor, the attorney general, and the legislature. As a result, a critically important lesson was learned that employees of the license holder or its successor must always be prohibited from becoming voting members of any citizens advisory panel. In this context, they do not fit the definition of a citizen. They only represent the interests of their stockholders and management. Inherently, and quite understandably, they cannot represent the best interests of the communities in which they operate because those interests are naturally at odds with the stockholders' interests. I also learned that it's essential to draw on the experience and knowledge of other communities. The information we received from Vermont's handicap was invaluable and greatly appreciated. This, in my opinion, is the best of the best practices other communities should adopt and embrace. Turning to the lessons I learned from the federal perspective, I learned that the doctrine of preemption, based on the supremacy clause as it applies to the licensing and regulation of nuclear power facilities, continues to solely benefit the nuclear power industry at the expense of public safety, health, environmental concerns of the citizens of the host community, the region, and the state. Since 1972, this doctrine has provided the legal basis for preventing 10 separate administrations in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, four Democrats and six Republicans, from effectively asserting the Commonwealth's right to protect its citizens and communities from the seemingly arbitrary and capricious actions and decisions of the NRC. Like so many of the lessons learned in our case, the Congress must bear the blame for allowing this to happen and continue. And just like the host communities, who are in fact spent nuclear waste dump sites for the foreseeable future, I find it difficult to believe personally that any member of Congress would have ever allowed preemption to apply to the NRC if they had known the communities in their districts or their states would end up also being de facto nuclear waste sites. Finally, the lessons I learned regarding the NRC. First, and again, I want to say that everyone I have personally interacted with at the NRC, including you, Mr. Watson, and several of your colleagues who are here tonight, have always been very responsive and professional. And I know I speak on behalf of all members of the NDCAP when I say thank you for the time you've spent with us in the past. That said, as our second president and local favorite son, John Adams, said, facts are stubborn things. In this case, the facts support my conclusion that the NRC's regulations, policies, and practices are rigged in favor of the nuclear power industry. 
For example, in May of this year, three months before the NRC approved the license transfer application, decommissioning plan and exemptions without any public hearings on the petitions to intervene, on the contentions, and on the motions, Entergy employees were openly saying that they had been told the NRC would approve the proposed deal on August 21st, three months in advance. Now, the folks here tonight had conversations with me about this. I personally spoke with NRC staff to determine whether this information was true because the NRC had told the handicap that no timetable had been established. It, like that old expression, you can look it up in our meetings. In telephone conversations and in written responses to my questions, I was told that the NRC could neither confirm nor deny that the employee's information was correct. As we all know, the NRC approved the license transfer on August 22nd. One day later, only one day later, than the employees knew three months in advance. Lesson learned. The fix was in. The fix was in between the NRC and the companies. By itself, this fact, in support of any reasonable person's conclusion, that the entire process was and is rigged in favor of the industry, the NRC is mandated to regulate. That's the fact. There is no disputing it. Unfortunately, there are many more examples of the results of the NRC's egregious failures to follow its own regulations, practices, in order to accommodate the corporate desires, convenience, and bottom line of the companies it is mandated to regulate. Each is another painful lesson learned. For example, Holtec's refusal to negotiate in good faith with the Commonwealth and its refusal to even discuss, never mind negotiate, critical issues with the town of Plymouth taught us a lesson that I hope every other community, every other state across the nation will both understand and keep in mind when they go through this process. The lesson was obvious from their first meeting with us with the handicap. Holtec refused to reach any agreement with the state or even discuss the town's request because they knew they didn't need to. They knew they didn't need to because they also knew virtually to the exact date when they would receive the approvals from the NRC. Fixed, rigged, those are the only two words that come to mind. Armed with this knowledge and assurance, Holtec knew it could run out the clock and refuse to answer even the simplest and most basic questions. For example, when asked to disclose how long the warranty period was on the dry cast storage containers they proposed to provide, a very simple question, Holtec refused to answer because they said that was proprietary information between them and Entergy. Between them and Entergy, that the community that the Citizens Advisory Board, that the state had no right to know how long he warranting these things for. When asked the basic question about the purchase of the assets owned by Entergy, Holtec refused to answer again because they said the pr information was proprietary. Time and time again, in virtually every instance, Holtec refused to answer basic questions about the commitments they would make to the Commonwealth or to the Town of Plymouth or to the region regarding the transaction, the sufficiency of funding, public safety, environmental, radiological standards, or payments in lieu of taxes. They stonewalled everybody except the NRC because they knew it didn't matter. They knew when they would be receiving the NRC's approvals right down to the date. The important lesson learned that I sincerely hope every community and state keeps in mind going forward is that as long as the industry knows the NRC will approve their applications and requests, regardless of the legitimate concerns that are raised even by their own state's attorney generals and quality, long-term invested organizations like Pilgrim Watch, the regulatory process is a sham. I believe it will remain that way until Congress takes action to correct it, and I hope they do. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, at this time, um, I would like to recognize uh, Kevin O'Reilly, who's the, the vice chair, and then uh, S uh, Senator Dan Wolf, who is also uh, a member of the NDCAP, um, but was also a co-author of the NDCAP legislation. Uh, my, uh, based on my information, uh, neither wants to speak at this time, um, but... Um, If you would like to speak, please come up. So a lot of people in here probably wrote no because you're instructed, and that's all I'm saying. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I, I apologize for the confusion as well. Um, Again, the, the, the point here is not to um, limit any member of the handicap with my comment. So um, would either um, Mr. O'Reilly or Mr. Wolf like to give comments at this time? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I didn't know you I'm sorry. So okay. please. Uh, Again, my name is Kevin O'Reilly, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Handicap. And, um, I want to thank you for coming this evening. I just want to start by saying that, um, as the Vice Chair of the Handicap, I agree with everything that Mr. Mullen said. So uh, I'm not going to plow over the same things that he talked about, because I think he was so eloquent in expressing our frustration. But I do have a few things that I want to relay to you folks, but I will be brief. Uh, I understand the stated purpose of the meeting is to identify best practices and lessons learned in operation of community advisory boards. But as others have stated, I think you are very late to the game as far as Plymouth is concerned. And now I understand why, because you're here by mandate of Congress. The fact that you're here after the license transfer was approved once again demonstrates that the NRC continues to ab abdicate your responsibilities when it comes to protecting the local communities. The Pilgrim Handicap was created due to the efforts of our state and local officials through state legislation. This should not be necessary. We should not have to go through this cumbersome process to have our concerns listened to by the NRC. The NRC should mandate that these committees become part of the decommissioning process and they should be supported and funded by the NRC. Our NDCAP has been in existence for over two years, and I have to say we have not had any substantial participation from the NRC, let alone the benefit of your expertise or your funds. At a minimum, there should be a representative from the NRC on each and every community advisory board so they can hear for themselves what the concerns are of the communities. The NRC's lack of communication and commitment to host communities leaves us to assume, as Sean and others have said, that you're putting the concerns of the industry ahead of local citizens. One of your bullet points talked about providing insight that the NDCAPs or the CAVs, as you call them, can provide input. But what's the point of providing input if it's ignored? I'll give you one quick example, and I'm sure many others in the room will have some of their own. The NRC has given the licensee an exemption to use funds from the decommissioning trust fund for spent fuel management and site restoration activities. Yet we are told there is no money to mitigate community impacts. But this money comes from local ratepayers, and the ratepayers have no say in how it is used. I suggest that you give local citizens the same rights and privileges as the industry you regulate and let our local officials and NDCAP groups provide input on how to mitigate local impacts. I sincerely doubt this will happen because we have seen time and time again that you hide behind the curtain of regulations. How about we let some common sense be part of the equation once in a while? You've already turned your back on Massachusetts by ignoring the requests of our Attorney General Healy and Senator Markey to delay your decision so we can continue the conversation. I hope you will not do the same to other host communities. They're facing the prospect of becoming long-term nuclear waste dumps. You need to get involved early in the NDCAP process, and you need to do a better job of representing local citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dan Wolf uh, from Cape Cod, uh, former senator and one of the sponsors. And I want to 
thank uh, my, my former fellow colleagues for putting this uh, legislation together. I want to thank the citizens who have done so much work. I especially want to thank for his passionate and right on comments uh, the chairman of NDCAP, uh, Sean Mullen. And therefore, he, he allowed me to be short because what he said, I, I would like to ditto and reinforce. I just want to make a couple of statements. First of all, uh, as someone who works in a highly regulated industry where our regulator has federal preemption, I'm going to speak with that authority, but I want to push back very quickly on a statement that was made at the beginning, which is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has extensive experience in overseeing the decommissioning. A handful of, plan a handful of decommissionings is not extensive experience, and the license was transferred to an entity that has zero experience. So, so that's a little bit off message because I'm going to get to a little bit about the public process. But I think it's really important that we understand part of that public process should be to have on the table the experience level, both of those doing the work and those regulators overseeing the work. Now on to the panel. Um, I think it's really important based on the hard work that went into forming the NDCAP, the work that's gone on to it by the panel members and by the concerned public who have put hours of exhaustive work and thought and energy and effort into having input into this process, that their voices be heard. It is so ironic. You want to talk about a sham. It is so ironic that tonight, shortly after this thing was approved, the license transfer was approved, in spite of all of the unheard input because of those who, who had filed to be, uh, to be heard, it is so ironic that you're here saying that you want to understand better how to hear tonight. I, I just, it, it blows me away. The entities, the, the vertical entities of government through which you should be hearing, the local, the regional, the state, and the federal, all have been knocking at the door to be part of this process and at this point have been disregarded and disrespected at a time when it is more important that employees of our government and elected officials try to embrace and involve and hear from our citizens. To be disregarded like this is simply another nail in the coffin of distrusting the process of government, of our democracy, and it cannot and will not stand. And there are so many examples in our own history and around the world of what happens when governments become that unresponsive and disrespectful of their citizens. It is time for the Congress to wake up. The Congress needs to insist that any legitimate questions coming from one of these panels or boards be answered in writing by the staff of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission prior to a decision being made. In writing. There needs to be a mandate in Congress that there be hearings, that if, if, if requests are made for hearings or intervener status, that the hearings be held prior to decisions being made. And finally, one of the first things we identified at NDCAP is we didn't have the resources to do our job. And there should be federal money that goes to these citizens' advisory panels so that they can actually work with consultants and actually do the work that we are chartered to do so that we can give the appropriate input. And the funding should come from the federal government, and Congress needs to hear that loud and clear without any of that. And I also agree with the chairman that, that the, the people on the citizens advisory panel need to be citizens. They can't be special interests. You know, this, is, this is an example yet again of where our government is letting our citizens down. You can't let the elephants guard the peanuts because they'll eat them. So, so in closing, um, you will be getting a lot of input, which we really are grateful that you're here tonight. From lessons learned in the process here in Plymouth and beyond in this area about what isn't working, and all I would say to the citizens and to the other members of NDCAP is don't lose heart because this is exactly the type of process when it fails that disempowers, disengages, and disgruntles the citizens from being involved in their government that they actually should and are a part of by the people for the people. Thank you very much again for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, uh, next, we have, um, and w again, I will, uh, any member of the, current member of the NDCAP uh, uh, can come up, but um, of the ones who have indicated that they would like to speak, uh, next I'm calling uh, Ms. Pine Dubois um, up.
thank you um, for coming. Thank you for um, at least putting the question out here. Um, thank you, Chairman Mullen, for your eloquence and um, being so right on, as well as Kevin O'Reilly and um, my senator. Um, the, the problem that we all face is a problem like what just happened to the Bahamas, okay? Who expected it, who did anything about it, and who responded? Um, this is an anniversary of twin hurricanes in the 50s coming to our shores here, and it was devastating. Never mind the 9-11 we all remember. The problem is the NRC is not nimble, let alone responsive. You're not responding to the climate changey thing. So therefore, when we at Endicap, you know, I'm chair of the so-called Site Restoration and Cleanup Committee, have a laugh on that one, really. I can't even get them to give me the site characterization report. You know why? They don't have to. Entergy was willing until there was a license transfer application and, uh, oh, gee, the Attorney General wanted answers, so we can't give you any because we can't give them to the AG and we certainly can't give them to Pilgrim Watch because God knows what they'll do with those answers. Things like what's contaminating our shores is public information. They don't get to keep that to themselves. We need to deal with that. How are you going to evaluate whether Holtex got enough money in the bank or not if you don't know what's in the ground? Do you? Do you know what's in the ground? I mean, fortunately, Entergy decided to move the waste up higher away from the shore. Fortunately, it took years to make that happen. It took a lot of effort. The town of Kingston is now spending, or taxpayers are now spending a couple of million dollars to take out a dam because of flood resiliency and climate change. The town of Plymouth is what? What is it, five million? How many millions in Plymouth to take out dams for resiliency in our communities? We're doing everything we can to to make a future, to allow a future, to sustain a future. But the single biggest difficulty we have is Pilgrim and the enormous quantity of waste that is there. And now we have a company that wants to be the giant of decommissioning. I want to believe them. I don't want any more slowdown. I want the shovel in the ground tomorrow. But if we don't know what they're going to clean up, we don't know that it got cleaned up. If, it, if we don't know what's there, how are we going to evaluate it and go, OK, anybody, anybody at all can go there and, oh, yeah, and it can go 10 feet underwater, too. It can't. You know why? Because Cape Cod Bay is the nursery for the fisheries in the Gulf of Maine. You contaminate this because you don't act, and you've contaminated everything, everything. You don't get to do that because you're the NRC and are afraid to act. It's too important, it's too vital, not just to those of us who are sitting here and could, you know, have an accident tomorrow. It's important to the future of our country. And if you're going to pretend that the citizens' advisory panels can advise and do the citizens' work without any information, where do you get off with that? You can't even make the EPA enforce their own damn permit that expired 24 years ago. You're not doing anything. You're filing paper. You're dealing with paper. I, I, I don't even know how you deal with all the paper you get. What we need to deal with is can we clean up this site? Can we deal with this waste that wants to last a million years because we're not smart enough to deal with it? Oh, no, we have to ship it 3,000 miles somehow? 
That's stupid. Everybody in this room knows that's stupid. So NRC, what's the answer? I'm supposed to figure it out sitting on a panel that doesn't have the authority to come to a consensus? Are you kidding me? Do I want to be on a panel that's going to clean up the site and be out there watching the shovels dig it all up? Yes, I do. I will do that, but not without any knowledge. So until you can give us knowledge, go back to DC. And when you go back to DC, tell the whole bucket load of people in DC to hurry up. We don't have any more time. The climate change is now. Dorian is a message. Take that message. Take the Bahama message. Take that home and tell yourself, we don't have time to screw around anymore. Thank you very much. Um, next we have Ms. Rebecca Chin, of the, the co-chair of the Duxbury Nuclear Advisory Commission. Hi, Rebecca Chin, co-chair of the Duxbury Nuclear Advisory Committee, speaking on behalf of the Board of Selectmen for the town of Duxbury. Uh, we appreciate that Congress instructed the NRC staff to identify best practices and lessons learned for the establishment and the operation of local community advisory boards in order to improve communication between the licensee and the public about decommissioning. But nowhere is it mentioned to improve real communication between the public and the NRC that goes beyond understanding the decommissioning process. We suspect this is because it is evident that the NRC is not interested in listening to the public and its input. We know this because the NRC approved a license transfer to Holtec before providing a hearing, an opportunity for substantive input from the Commonwealth and Pilgrim Watch. The Duxbury Board of Selectmen recently sent Chairman Svicki a letter requesting that the NRC delay or reverse the decision on Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station's license transfer until after the Commission has ruled upon the petition to intervene and motions for hearing requests currently on docket 50-293 and 72-1004. The petitions and motions were filed in the correct fashion and within the relevant deadlines. We urge the Commission to grant the petitions for hearing in order to improve transparency and provide an opportunity for the interveners to get answers to their questions about the applicants. For example, Holtec has demonstrated no interest in communicating with the town, either Duxbury Board of Selectmen or Plymouth. We've sent issues important to the town to discuss with Holtec, Holtec and had no response. Who do you believe? Th thank you very much for your comments. Um, are there any other uh, NDCAP members or community advisory uh, uh, panel members who would like to offer comments at this time? Please, sir. Good evening, Richard Rothstein. I'll be brief. As the former chairman of the Nuclear Matters Committee for the Town of Plymouth Board of Selectmen, as a current NDCAP member, and most importantly, having worked over four decades in power, industrial waste management, and transportation, licensing and permitting, environmental consultant, involved with building nuclear plants since the early 70s when many of you were in grade school or maybe haven't been born yet, I would like to see the NRC within the next seven days Seven days from now, our NDCAP's going to have its monthly meeting. There's seven days that I'd like to see our panel receive from the appropriate NRC department the justification for how the license transfer was approved in terms of demonstrating the financial viability and the engineering capability of the whole tech team. A decision was made. Is based on facts. 
I'd like to see those facts. I can't advise people in this room and others on the panel till I have those facts. I can be the best supporter of the NRC, as I've tried to be over the years, or I can be the worst enemy. Don't make me be the worst enemy. Thank you. Um, are there any other NDCAP members uh, who would like to offer comments at this time? Okay. Um, just speaking personally, I would like to thank, as, as was noted by Bruce, all the, the NDCAPs that we're aware of are voluntary, meaning that um, in, in terms of citizen participation in them. And so I'd like to personally um, thank um, everyone who has stepped up to be a member of the NDCAP here or at some other reactor site. Um, it takes a lot to, uh, I mean, I've heard, we've heard, it been in multiple of these meetings before, I know how much work um, goes into it, or that's what we've heard from members. Um, and so I just wanna personally say how much I appreciate your level of involvement in this process. Um, and also for those of you who came out to speak tonight, thank you again. Okay, we're now going to turn to the public comment portion. So it is roughly uh, 724, um, and I think I have about 16 people signed up to speak. So, um, so at that, I'm going to give everyone, um, I think, f how about four minutes? So more than three, four. And then if there's some time at the end, we can do um, uh, people come back up again. Does that sound reasonable to everyone? Okay. So um, because of that, because I'm going to try to give everyone who signed up an opportunity to speak, we're just going to win an order so I don't waste time trying to draw tickets out of the bucket, okay? So we're just going to go first to number one. That is Peter Brown. Uh, my name is Peter Brown. I am a resident of Cape Cod. Been living there for five years. I grew up in Duxbury. So I have two community interests that I see in jeopardy. Uh, first of all, I want to ask, is there anybody else here from Cape Cod? Well, I think that's very important that we have, you know, that sort of engagement. But what I notice most of all is the absence of young people here. No. I think that young people need to be somehow, you know, brought into this discussion because they're going to own this, not you, all right? And there has to be some sort of motivating factor that makes young people wake up to this. It's their community. This is their problem. I've been around in emergency communication drills, emergency preparedness drills of all kinds, multi-agency, military, non-military, work with mobile communications and incident command posts on wheels. And I want to just say that one of the big problems, you see new faces all the time. You know, the agencies don't consistently present people to you that you will get to know over a prolonged period. Something needs to be done to address that. And we have community involvement that represents, you know, a decade long or more, often a decade long or more commitment, but the agencies and the companies come and go. That is a problem because of the kinds of communication that has to go on here. I'm a satellite guy in my in my past, I focused on satellite communications. I think that, you know, what sorts of mechanisms we can employ to better enhance communications at all levels needs to be identified. And what is the purpose of the exercise if it's communications-based? That is another thing that I'm concerned about. In incident command, I've worked on hospital emergency communications guidelines. One of the problems we have, we don't drill enough. We really don't drill enough. You have to get down to where the rubber meets the road and demonstrate that if something goes wrong, things are gonna happen. This is a community by community effort that has to be undertaken. We don't know. We don't know what's gonna happen. So you've got to be ready to take that into account, all right? 
And everybody in this room knows what's happening in Japan right now, right? An open discussion of ocean disposal of radioactive material. That water, that wastewater that's coming out of that operation is going to wind up in the Pacific Ocean. In Plymouth, with its rich history of fishing, and with Cape Cod Bay right at our doorstep, we can't afford to have that somehow years down the road become an option for Pilgrim. So we need to kind of broaden our awareness. We need to bring younger energy into this mix. We somehow have to facilitate a more effective solution or search for solutions. And that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Next, we will have uh, Miss Mary Lampert. Ah, uh, yes, Mary Lampert, Pilgrim Watch Director, also Vice Chair of the Duxbury <laughs> Nuclear Advisory Committee and a petitioner. Um, I'll first speak to the exam question before getting into the importance of communication, not just with the licensee, but the regulator. Uh, there are four points uh, on the cabs that I'd like to address. The first is money, and that's first and foremost in importance. Uh, it's important that it be funded by uh, the NRC and not taken out of the insufficient decommissioning trust funds. Uh, and the importance of it is demonstrated for the need, we don't have it, but there is a need for administrative assistance in particular so that a robust uh, website can be developed, which we don't have. They can have important documents such as the PSDARs, the license transfer, independent analysis of the vulnerability of spent fuel casts, et cetera, et cetera. It's also important to be able to hire independent experts so that the uh, group here is not just from uh, the licensee or from NRC. Uh, so money is critical. We don't have it, but it's necessary. Uh, the second is membership. Uh, it's clear that the licensees should not be members of the Citizen Advisory Board. Sean Mullen discussed that clearly. Uh, it's important that they be required to come to each meeting so they can answer questions and give updates but certainly not sitting on the panel. It's also important that each EPZ community uh, be represented and be appointed by the boards of selectmen. So many of the appointments to the boards we have here come out of the um, legislators at the State House, either the House Chair, the Senate Chair, the minority leaders, et cetera. Well, they don't frankly know who knows anything about the subject or care, you know, cares about it. And so that is clearly, I think, a mistake. It's also important that unique geographic areas uh, also get appointments. Cape Cod would be an example. M importance to have at least a couple of citizens from the Cape being appointed by pertinent um, Cape Cod um, economic and environmental um, region-wide uh, groups. Uh, and it's important uh, to have also representatives from uh, pertinent state agencies that will be involved in the process that they have designees that appear. This gets to the next uh, point, which is voting. Uh, currently, the NDCAP here uh, requires voting to be done uh, by the majority of its members. And uh, that was discussed by Sean Mullen as a bad trick played essentially by the House. Um, that's a mistake because many of the members, uh, many don't make every meeting, number one, and those appointed to represent state agencies do not have the authority to cast a vote because they need prior approval by the secretaries of whatever agency they're from. So voting should be purely the majority of those in attendance 
so something can be done. Last, there should be the development of subcommittees because uh, the whole group meeting uh, once a month, how much can they actually accomplish? You need subcommittees to review, one committee to review documents, another one to review uh, spent fuel issues, another one to review site restoration, another one to review security, and what, what other interests that the community may have. But those are my four key, having attended every meeting uh, of the board here, and uh, they've done the best job with bad legislation. Uh, as others have commented, and obviously I will too, uh, it is a, a sort of a sick joke <laughs> that you're here about public, uh, getting public communication. But Congress was wise, having it limited to communication between the citizens and the licensees. However, I give thanks, as always, to Senator Markey, who mentioned, uh, Jim Cantwell mentioned in his comments, that he will have hearings to discuss the key problem that there is not communication of any meaningful nature between the public and the NRC. Public safety, public interest in general, protection of public health and safety is something that has disappeared in the NRC. And instead, it is a captured industry by the industry. And it, it's clear. And what has made this clear, obviously, is approving the license transfer without providing the opportunity of hearings for the Attorney General representing the Commonwealth and from Pilgrim Watch, all of whom filed their contentions in a timely manner and following the rules of filing to a T. That is an insult. Uh, where we're going to go from there, but the game is not over as far as we're concerned. However, I think also I will have to uh, emphasize that there has not been co any communication either the town of Duxbury, the town of Plymouth, the NDCAP with Holtec. Holtec has come to these NDCAP meetings. Questions are asked. They provide no answers at all. And so it is clear that we've got a bad land landlord, which does not leave good feelings. And therefore, the NRC, it's important, has to step up to the plate, or as federal court, let's be real, has to step up to the plate. Because there are major concerns. There's an insufficiency of funds, number one. Holtec admitted a month ago that they did, hadn't reviewed, done any analysis of the site. You cannot rely on site assessments done in 2002 and 2007 and think they're adequate today. And so without knowing what's on the site, with sea level rise, et cetera, et cetera, what's, on, what's in the soil, what's in the tanks, and the buried pipes are going to be left in the ground, where are they going to go? All that contamination is going into Cape Cod Bay or into the second largest aquifer in Massachusetts, which Pilgrim sits on top of. And so we will be left with holding the bag for the money. We'll be left with a dirty site. And we're also going to be left with a company, both Holtec and SNC-Lavalin, that have a long and sordid history of malfeasance, OK? Big, serious character issues that the NRC has not evaluated. Thank you for your comment. <coughs> um, I, I, again, thank you. Um, so uh, right now, uh, again, I, I haven't set the, the chime on because I find it disruptive, or I know you find it disruptive. So, But again, so make sure that everyone can uh, have an opportunity to speak. Try to keep your comments to around four to five minutes. I don't want to interrupt anyone because that's I don't enjoy it. You don't enjoy it. So let's all 
play together, keep your comments to roughly around four to five minutes, okay? So that way we can make sure everyone has an opportunity to speak, all right? Before we need to vacate the room for the sake of the hotel. Um, okay, so next up, I apologize for the interruption, we have Elaine Dickman. I, again, uh, apologize if I'm mispronouncing, but Elaine Dickman, ticket number four. Dickinson. Okay. Um, hi, Diane Turco from Cape Town Windows. Um, and you know, I have to start by saying it's just so unfortunate that this beautiful town of Plymouth is a nuclear waste dump. It has been for a long time and it will be for a long time to come. Um, but we can all agree that responsible and safety commissioning is the priority in order to protect our communities. Now that Congress has tasked the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to elicit public comments on best practices and lessons learned for citizen advisory boards, perhaps there will be real movement for effective public engagement. The NRC has not done its job and has been a failure at resp responding to vital public input. Petitions, letters, concerns, filings, and all efforts meet with rejection. So hopefully Congress will fulfill our social contract and return power to local and state stakeholders through effective cabs. Not advisory, but with real authority so our concerns will be addressed and enacted. Now, the Yankee Road Decommissioning was challenged back in the 1990s by a community action group, Citizens Awareness Network. Can won a lawsuit against the NRC and Yankee Atomic over the illegal cleaning of the site. The NRC was found to be arbitrary, capricious, and utterly ir irrational in its handling of decommissioning. It sounds familiar. The district court wrote in his decision that the NRC's actions reminded him of the office of circumlocution in Charles Dickens' Bleak House. The potential for NRC using tactics at other decommissioning sites was disturbing given the community's vital interest in an effective cleanup. A short victory for the citizen intervention. However, as the NRC does, they responded, their response was to eviscerate public and state participation by changing their rules. Can also submitted a plan for cabs back in 1996 for um, citizen advisory boards to engage in decommissioning. 1996 you had this. Cabs have been promoted by public, the public for decades, yet today when so many reactors are scrambling to decommission, the NRC is commanded by Congress to look at the current state of affairs because they have failed to do so. For example, our own NDCAP, and thank you, Sean, and the whole NDCAP group and our, our elected officials for their statements tonight. Um, for example, our own NDCAP has been working very hard to communicate with both Holtec and the NRC with limited results. Holtec promised openness and transparency during the license transfer application process. Not only did Entergy and Holtec refuse to answer questions related to the license transfer application, but the NRC approved the transfer over the objection of our own Attorney General Maura Healy and Pilgrim Watch. The license transfer was approved without a hearing to intervene. Now Holtec has no incentive to negotiate with the state. Cape Town Winters and Cannes sent a letter to the NRC signed by 96 organizations from across the U.S. and Canada asking for the license transfer to be suspended until all the contentions were heard and resolved. Concerns for safety commissioning go way beyond the border of Massachusetts. They all know this process is rigged. The NRC is a rubber stamp for the nuclear industry. This sham of a license transfer clearly demonstrates this reality. We now look to Congress to grab the reins and lead. In the Energy Reorganization Act of 1974, the Atomic Energy Commission was abolished due to promotion of the nuclear industry and was replaced with the NRC. We see that same pattern repeated at Pilgrim as the NRC approves exemptions for use of decommissioning trust funds without conditions, ignores environmental concerns, reduces emergency planning, and supports Holtec's financial plans even when the numbers don't add up. And with all due respect to you folks from the NRC today, you should be ashamed for sitting behind those nameplates, NRC, because you are failing the public and you are failing your mandate to protect the public and environment. So, Here's our lessons learned. Tell Congress, expecting passive participation by the public is an affront to our rights and responsibilities as citizens. The public has no trust in the NRC. We demand a democratic process to directly influence policies and plans that vitally affect our communities. Cape Town Winders calls for the abolishment of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to be replaced with an independent intergovernmental agency, excluding industry representatives, 
and including CABs with state and local stakeholders that have real authority to influence policies and practices for the protection of our communities. Thank you very much. Next we have uh, Mr. Lampert, uh, uh, ticket number five. Jim Lampert, Pilgrim Watch, I work for the director. <laughs> I have a number of concerns, but we're obviously restrained on time. My basic concern has already been to some extent addressed here, but the only reason you're here tonight or at the other dozen or so places you're going is because Congress told you you had to come. I've seen no evidence that you're here because the NRC institutionally intends to listen to or consider public concerns. The slides that were posted for this meeting, which are frankly are quite different than the ones that we've seen tonight, make this fairly clear. There was a slide in the original group called CAB Responsibilities. It says nothing about the NRC actually working with the Citizens Advisory Board. The slide entitled NEMA 108 Report refers to interactions between could be between a board and the commission. But the only interaction it talks about is between the advisory board and Holtec, the licensee, not between the advisory board on a substantive level with the NRC. And as you've heard tonight, dialogue with Holtec is a bad joke. The slides say that the NRC staff considers public comments and other feedback about PSDARs. So far as the public can say, that is simply not true. Staff recently put out a long safety evaluation. A lot of boilerplate. It talked about what Holtec had to say. It said zero about the 80 pages of facts that were in the Pilgrim Watch petition, another 40 pages of facts that were in the Commonwealth petition, and about 40 pages of comments on the PSDR that I personally wrote and sent to the staff last March. You would have hoped that the staff would have at least read them. There's absolutely no evidence that they did. I'm concerned in the same lane, vain about the staff letting Holtec take half of the decommissioning trust fund for spent fuel costs in a decision that if you want to read it, is equally devoid of any reference to the facts that the public brought to their attention and they should have talked about it. It's not that they discussed them and said, oh, we don't agree with these. They didn't even bother to say anything. We said, among other things, that Holtec should be required to put the money it gets back from DOE back into the fund to pay, they get it from DOE to pay for the same costs that they took it out for. No mention. I'm concerned with the staff's attempt to justify its decision that, oh, there's plenty of money by saying the NRC staff has the ability to take action on funding def deficiencies. A second year law student could tell you that that is simply not true. If there's a funding deficiency, it's because Holtec Pilgrim has run out of money. You can't get money out of a bankrupt stone. And the NRC has no legal authority or ability to get money from anybody but a licensee which won't have any, it can't get anything from Holtec International, it can't get anything from Energy. I have no faith that Holtec will clean up Pilgrim or that the NRC will really ensure that it does so. Holtec doesn't know what contamination is there, as you've heard tonight. And Holtec's and SNC Lavalin's past history does not give me any reason to trust them. In short, I've long been concerned and I remain concerned that the NRC is far more interested in protecting the $800 million profit that Holtec intends to get out of this project than it is in listening to or working with the public. Thank you very much. Um, next we have, so Ms. Turco, you, you spoke already. Would you like to give your ticket to someone else, please? Okay. Okay, 
My name is Elaine Dickinson, and I am from Cape Downwinders. The letter which Diane mentioned uh, a few speakers ago was sent out to the chair of the NRC, and it caught fire. Ag other um, organizations around the country have signed on to this. They are all watching and paying attention. It was started by Cape Downwinders of Harwich, Citizens Awareness Network, Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts, and these people signed, these organizations signed on. Albuquerque Monthly Meeting of the Religious Society of Friends, New Mexico, Algonquin Echo Watch, Ontario, Canada, Al Alliance for Environmental Strategies, Eunice, New Mexico, Alliance to Halt Fermi Three, Livonia, Michigan, American Friends Service Committee, Cambridge, Mass, Association to Preserve Cape Cod, Dennis, Mass, Beyond Nuclear, Tacoma Park, Maryland, Boston Downwinders, Newton, Mass, Bruce Center for Energy Research Information in Vernon, Ontario, Canada, Bronx Climate Justice, North Bronx, New York, Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security, Cambridge, Mass., Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility, Montreal, Quebec, Canton Residents for a Sustainable, Equitable Future, Canton, Mass., Citizens Against Radioactive Neighborhoods, Peterborough, Ontario, Citizens Against the Rehoboth Compressor Station, Mass., Rehoboth, Mass. Citizens for Alternatives to Radioactive Dumping, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Citizens Power Incorporated, Pittsburgh, PA. Citizens Resistance at Fermi II, Redford, Michigan. Clean Water Action, Brick, New Jersey. Coalition Against Nukes, Sag Harbor, New York. Coalition for a Nuclear Free Great Lakes, Monroe, Michigan. Committee for Future Generations, Boval, Saskatchewan, Canada. Concerned Citizens for Nuclear Safety, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Concerned Citizens of Allegheny County, Incorporated, Angelica, Angelica, New York. Concerned Citizens of Lacey, LLC, Lacey, New Jersey. Don't Waste Michigan, Holland, Michigan. Duxbury Nuclear Advisory Committee, Duxbury, Mass. Elders Climate Action, Massachusetts, Cambridge, Mass. Engage Falmouth, Falmouth, Mass. Environmental Massachusetts Research and Policy Center, Boston, Mass. Friends of the Earth, Washington, D.C. Grams, Grandmothers, Mothers, and More for Energy Safety, Brick, New Jersey, Greenpeace USA, Washington, D.C., Gray Panthers of Met Metro Detroit, Michigan, Greater Boston Physicians for Social Responsibility, Boston, Mass., Heart of America Northwest, Seattle, Washington, Hudson River Sloop Clearwater Incorporated, Beacon, New York, Indian Point Safe Energy Coalition, Cortland Manor, New York, League of Women Voters, Cape Cod Area, Massachusetts. League of Women Voters, Plymouth, Mass. Plymouth Area, Massachusetts. Mass Peace Action, Cambridge, Mass. Martha's Vineyard Island, 350, Tisbury, Mass. Mass Perg, Boston, Mass. Janet, New Mexico Interfaith Power and Light, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Michigan Safe Energy Future, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Michigan Stop the Nuclear Bomb Campaign, St. Clair Shores, Michigan. Mid-Missouri Peace Works, Columbia, uh, Missouri. Mountain States Mennonite Conference, Taos, New Mexico, Native Community Action Council, Las Vegas, Nevada, Natural Resources Defense Council, Washington, D.C., Nevada Nuclear Waste Task Force, Las Vegas, Nevada, New Mexico Environmental Law Center, Santa Fe, New Mexico, New York Safe Energy Campaign, New York, New York, Newton Dialogues, Newton Mass, No Fossil Fuel and Clean Power, Kingston, Mass., No More Fukushima's, Amesbury, Mass., North America Water Office, Lake Elmo, Minnesota, Northwatch, Northeastern Ontario, Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, New York, Nuclear Energy Information, Chicago, Illinois, Nuclear Information and Resource Services, Tacoma Park, Maryland, Nuclear Issues Study Group, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Oak Ridge Environmental Peace Alliance, Oak Ridge, New Tennessee, Occupy Bergen County, Bergen County, New Jersey. Occupy Hingham, Hingham, Mass. On behalf of Planet Earth, Watertown, Mass. Palisade Shutdown Campaign Coalition, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Peace Abbey Foundation, Sherbin, Mass. Physi Physicians for Social Responsibility, Kansas City, Metro Area, Missouri, Kansas. Pilgrim Coalition, Plymouth, Mass. Pilgrims for Safety Commissioning, Plymouth, Mass. Project Andrews County, Andrews, Texas, Red Wool Alliance, Arcata, um, California, Safe and Green Campaign, Brattleboro, Vermont, Safe Energy Rights Group, Peekskill, New York, Samuel Lawrence Foundation, Del Mar, California, Shut Down Indian Point Now, New York, Sierra Club, Massachusetts, 
Sierra Club National Nuclear Free Campaign, Oakland, California, Six Ponds Improvement Association, Plymouth, Mass, Stop Algonquin Pipeline Expansion, Rockland, Putnam, Westchester Counties, New York, Sugar Law Center for Economic and Social Justice, Detroit, Michigan, Sustainable Energy and Economic Development Coalition, Austin, Texas, Sustainable Middleborough, Middleborough, Mass., Sustainable South Shore, Norwell, Mass., Three Mile Island Alert, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Toledo Coalition for Safe Energy, Toledo, Ohio, Toxics Action Center, Boston, Mass., UU Mass Action, Marlboro, Mass., Vermont Yankee Decommissioning Alliance, Montpelier, Vermont, Watertown Citizens for Peace, Justice, and the Environment, Watertown, Mass., Women's Energy Matters, Fairfax, California, and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, Cape Cod Chapter, Harwich, the country and Canada are watching your failure to follow the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's mandate to protect the public and the environment. Shame. Thank you, thank you for the comments. I'm gonna just take one second to say, is that you're, you're, you're right, a number of people have mentioned before that this meeting is required. I, I'm not gonna deny that, we were required to be here. The question is what you do with this meeting. And this is an opportunity to present your views to Congress and to the NRC about what the CABs could be. Um, and look, I'm not, I can't make you any promises and anything will come of that. But what I'm saying to you, clearly you have hope because you're here. If you didn't have hope, why would you be in this audience right now? That things can get better. So the question is, is or the, what I would propose to you, and I'm only speaking on behalf of myself, is to avail yourself of this opportunity. Can't promise anything will come of it, but make the most of it because you have it. Like you have an opportunity right now to have a say in how this goes forward and tell Congress how the cab should be. And I just ask you to take advantage of that tonight because we're here. Even if we're required to be here, we're still here to hear from you. So with that, we are going to move to number seven, and again, I apologize if I mispronounce your name, John Kleinman. Oh. Sorry. That's right. I thought I was seven. So please. You want to move away? No, no, that's I'm, I'm going to skip to you anyway. All my uh, concerns have already been addressed and then some. Okay. Okay, thank you. So that was John Kleinman's. I lost my ticket. I thought it was seven, but it was eight. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you. I'm Henrietta Cosentino. Okay. And I'm here to speak for the Plymouth Area League of Women Voters and for men, women, and children in our state and across this land that we love because all of them will one way or another face this situation. The League has pushed for a national policy that incorporates maximum environmental safeguards and maximum protection of public health. We urge strong publication, public participation in these matters. But you, and I do not mean you personally, I mean you at the NRC, have made a mockery of citizen input. You've made a mockery of environmental safeguards. You've awarded the license transfer to a company with zero decommissioning experience, dubious ethics, no transparency, and every incentive to do a quick and dirty job. You ignore long-standing petitions from the Attorney General's office and Pilgrim Watch, ignore the urgent concerns of our senators and legislators, ignore our select board, ignore our citizens' advisory panel and decap. And I will not try to repeat all that Sean said, but I just want you to know that in, in order to, to answer the questions that you say you're here to ask, I absolutely endorse every single word he said. As, as I do, on behalf of the League, endorse everything that Pilgrim Watch has said. Um, you have also ignored citizens and environmental groups. This is shameful. Who knows what cleanup will entail or how much it will cost? You have not required a current environmental impact study as Pine Dubois noted. This is shameful. You've exempted the licensee from emergency preparation and planning requirements. Shameful. You exempted the licensee from safety upgrades that would, would prevent a Fukushima-like disaster. Shameful. 3,000 spent 
fuel rods, more or less, remain in the fuel pool? What could go wrong? An event beyond design, leading to loss of coolant, hydrogen explosion, or zirconium fire. God forbid. Shameful. 17 dry casks sit on the shore of Cape Cod Bay right now. Each holds more than half the cesium released at Chernobyl. The cask is warranted for 20 years. The half-life of plutonium is 24,000 years. Shameful. It is the most toxic substance on the face of the earth in casks in which concrete cladding could erode in salt air, hastening cracks and le leakage. Radioactivity could corrode the inner structure of steel. Shameful. Now imagine a Category 5 storm making a direct hit on Pilgrim, taking the lesson of the Bahamas. A lightning strike, a monster tidal surge, a microblast, a tornado, an earthquake. Yes, there was a study in 2014 that shows that indeed there is an earthquake damage here. And since it is 9-11, emergency, call 911, a terrorist attack, your job is to serve and protect us. Instead, you serve and protect the interests of a private, for-profit, sleazy corporate entity. Shameful. Stay that decision. This is not all right. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next, we have um, Ms. Susan Carpenter of uh, Cape Town Windows. I am finding that this meeting has some very bizarre aspects. Um, I looked at the questionnaire, and most of the questions seem to be things you already know about when the board started, um, how many people, um, and it doesn't really solve anything. Um, I remember at one time when I really believed that I lived in a democracy. Um, I don't believe that anymore. I remember one of the first meetings, I don't remember, it was the first or the second of NDCAP. A motion was made, and the voting took place, and that was when I realized that the industry could block anything that the panel wanted to do. And that just totally destroyed my faith in what we're doing here. I think it's time that we let people have a place in the hierarchy of what's needed, and we need to let go of the corporate interests that basically rule everything the NRC does. Thank you, thank you very much. Next, we have um, Ms. Joanne Corrigan of uh, Cape Town Winders. Hi, Joanne Corrigan, Plymouth, Mass. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to all the members of the NCAP. I went to a couple of their meetings. They were long, they were informative. And then I realized this is like shoveling sand against the tide. They have no teeth no authority, they're gonna be busting their butts, compiling information and advising, and we know where you put the ad advising rules, things people send to you. Um, but I did wanna thank them for their service and for all the time and energy they put into it. Also, Pixie, Diane, um, a lot of people have researched a lot of problems with Pilgrim from the get-go. All of them just, you know, ignored by the NRC. My question, one of the questions is, how does Holtec take beautiful Plymouth, beautiful ocean historical community, and that's their OJT for de decommissioning a power plant? This is their on-the-job on the training, pilgrim. I mean, it's outrageous. 
but I also have to remember that the NRC's primary objective has always been to protect the nuclear industry and not humans and not people's health, safety, and well-being. So doing the de decommissioning, I doubt the NRC will, well, they will just continue not, they will continue not to um, put people first. The NRC has always been in bed with the nuclear power industry. They formed some kind of unholy alliance, and you, nothing we say or do is going to change anything. Unfortunately, Massachusetts was sold down the river when they gave Boston Edison carte blanche to build here. Vermont, on the other hand, their decommission, their licensing had to go through their state legislature. And their plant was operating beautifully, not in column four like this thing was in perpetuity. And they just didn't want it in the state anymore. And they made it close. Um, we don't have those options, unfortunately. But I believe that NRC will never put people first. And they have no credibility. The NRC, NRC has continued to thumb their nose at the host community, our governor, all our uh, congressional uh, uh, delegates, the AG. I mean, everybody. Holtec could care less because you people are going to back them. So as far as I'm concerned, the NRC has no credibility. And let's not forget, the if you want to talk about the extensive experience the NRC has, <laughs> it's true. They have it in being in uh, snow jobs and being in bed with the nuclear power industry. <laughs> and let's not forget, this is the same group that gave Pilgrim a cybersecurity pass in this day when everybody's taking everybody's grids down. Um, they put the cast, gave permission to put the cast practically, you know, next to the ocean. Well, they are next to the ocean. They just figured out now, oh, gee, when we have nor'easters, high tides and full moons, that water comes in about 30 feet. They just figured that out. Well, it's too late because those things are much closer than 30 feet. And let's not forget the site that NRC also gave you that great evacuation plan, plan for everybody at the Cape where they will shoot you if you try to get off the bridge, any of the bridges, the state police will shoot you until they empty out Plymouth, Kingston, and Duxbury with a leak of nuclear radiation. And I told them at that meeting, you're not from here, are you? And they said, oh, no, we're from the King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. I said, you can't get out of Plymouth on a Sunday night in July and August, and that plan doesn't work. And it's still not going to work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Ms. Claire Miller um, of the Tox Toxics Action Center. Claire Miller. I'm the lead community organizer for Toxics Action Center. We're a public health and environmental nonprofit here in the region. And my entire job is to drive out and meet with communities that are trying to clean up and prevent pollution. My job involves entering communities that are not mine and working with impassioned, talented, amazing folks who are standing up for their community. And I can tell you that the number one quality that is needed to do that work is trust. That you need to be able to develop relationships and have respect and trust in order to work with a community. And when I look at this questionnaire, I feel like all of the most important questions are not here. There aren't any questions about trust and respect. The questions I would add are, has the community advisory board felt listened to by the NRC? Be really curious to hear from around the country with the answers to that question. Like to know, add to the questionnaire, does the Community Advisory Board trust the NRC? I'd like Congress to read that report. 
Does the NRC seem like a captured agency to the community advisory boards? Tell Congress that the community advisory boards should have the authority, the power, the resources to actually do the work that the NRC won't. Tell Congress the community advisory boards are amazing, dedicated, incredible people doing the most needed work and that the NRC needs a complete and utter overhaul. Thank, thank you for your comments. Um, next we have uh, Ms. Margaret Stevens of uh, Cape Town Windows. I'm Margaret Stevens from uh, Cape Cod Down Winders. Um, you know, you mentioned that this was an opportunity. Uh, what is it an opportunity for? It's a done deal. I don't know uh, what we can do about it. We don't feel that Whole Tech is a company that should have gotten this uh, transfer or was able should have been able to buy this plant and. Um, what, what can we do? But I would like to find out how this decision was made. And I think the NRC uh, should give the public uh, a report on how this de decision was made. Because it does sound as though um, they, they jumped the shock, actually. And they just made a date. It's going to be a done deal. So. We should have a full report. So th th this happened last night as well. This is like the, so two nights in a row, I, I'm not gonna continue to hold it like this. Um, or I, a microphone just dies on me, I don't know what the fates are trying to tell me. Um, anywho, um, we're not going to answer that question. Um, next, we're going to move on to Miss. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, next, we'll move to Miss Rosemary Shields. Hi, I'm Rosemary Shields, and I have not much else to say. Everybody else has said pretty much what needed to be said. I just want you to know that I represent the League of Women Voters of the Cape Cod area. And for over 50 years, the League of Women Voters has tried to get local citizens and communities to have input into the cleanup of nuclear waste we actually have in our impact on issues. So this has been a long-standing uh, view of the League of Women Voters. And uh, I'm sure we'll be... Uh, contacting uh, the NRC as, as a group. And I'm, I'm just glad that uh, Plymouth is also here. There are a lot of members of the League of Women Voters, and this is a very important issue. And everything that everybody has said, I'm just saying ditto. Thank, thank you very much. Next, we will, next we'll have uh, Mr. John uh, Gailey. And again, I miss, uh, apologize for mispronouncing. Golly, at number 14. Is he with us still? He had to leave? Okay. So we'll move on to Mr. Frank Mand, M-A-N-D. Is Frank still here? All right. Okay. So we're going to move on to Gary uh, Londigal. Londigo? Please. I, again, apologize for mispronunciations. So uh, I'll be very brief tonight. Um, uh, Jerry Londigan, uh, former chairman of an electric utility in Massachusetts. Uh, I've been watching Pilgrim for years, and uh, I'm convinced that the problem of high-level nuclear waste is going to continue to be a problem. And I'm not so sure that there is a solution. So, but one of the things that I would suggest is that things have to change in this country. And we have an election next year. 
And I would suggest that to everyone here tonight that you get involved in the electoral process for us to have a new president. And hopefully, or maybe, she'll be from Massachusetts. <laughs> I, f I feel like if I say thank you, um, violating the Hatch Act. So um, <laughs> just going to say thank you for coming this evening. Um, so anyway, so next, <laughs> sorry, next we have up uh, Mr. Stephen uh, Buckley. Stephen Buckley of OpenMetrics, OpenGovMetrics.com. Okay, good. Right on, Steve Buckley. I'm from Chatham on the Cape, and uh, but uh, in a previous life, I spent 25 years uh, in Washington, most of the time as an environmental engineer for uh, several federal agencies, and uh, uh, a lot of that work, uh, environmental cleanup, public projects, had to do with public engagement, and so uh, it occurred to me over the course of time that the uh, science and engineering part of it was the easy part and the hard part was explaining was the scientists and engineers uh, having to explain it to the non-scientists and engineers meaning 99% of the other or 99.9% .9 of the other people and um, including the people who had to live with whatever you built or cleaned up so uh, the uh, 25 years ago uh, the Department of Energy where I was working for at headquarters, uh, started a number of public meetings because they were just beginning their cleanup of nuclear weapons facilities all around the country, uh, like at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Hanford, Washington, Rocky Flats, Colorado, and so forth. And I would sit in the back of these meetings and listen to what people who had been waiting, who had been much more uh, downwinders, um, you're talking about a much higher degree of contamination uh, you know, dust clouds and so forth, uh, who had been waiting 40 years to have a say. And unfortunately, um, the meetings were more of the open-ended part where I will say this meeting is very similar, where it's kind of like, hey, we need to do something about this. Tonight is about best practices. And so it's throwing it out to the non-experts, hey, what should we do about that thing? And they were asking at that time, the people, so we're going to start cleaning stuff up. What do you think? And so they're like, uh, take it away. <laughs> like, I don't know, you tell me. They're, we're, we're supposed to be the experts. So by taking the first step, that's the first as constructive criticism, to, to throw it out to the public and say it's, it's, it's premature. You, people want to have something they can look at and chew on and review. And it can't be a take it or leave it approach. So, um, because then people feel that's rigged also, and a decision has been made, so forth and so on. So, what I'd like to do is point out that uh, even though I no longer work for the federal government, um, cursed with the knowledge of having seen it work in some places, and um, the uh, Obama administration actually, on their first day in office, President Obama signed what amounts to a uh, improved listening program, they called it open government, where all federal agencies were directed by the president to do a better job at including citizens in the decision making process. And uh, eight years later, they basically just didn't do anything. I went to a number of meetings I represented at that time, the International Association for Public Participation, would go to quarterly meetings and um, not Surprisingly, because like I said, I spent 25 years down there, they issued reports and revised those implementation reports and so forth and so on. The NRC, if you actually go to the, I'm telling people here, if you go to the nrc.gov, across the top, under the, uh, on the various tabs there, there's public information and uh, whatever, uh, public information meetings, which you will find, um, see information there at the very par top part, it says, NRC's approach to open government. And you'll find all the stuff that's been going on for the past mm, 10 years almost. A lot of implementation plans. The thing they leave out, unfortunately, and that's why I say I'm, I 
I knew as an engineer that you needed to measure. If you're going to get better at something, you've got to know where you are now and then afterwards. Kind of like going on a diet. You won't know what the diet works if you didn't weigh yourself in the beginning. But you've got to know what the scale is and what you're measuring. And really, when it comes right down to it, you're, you're measuring um, the people's satisfaction if they feel like they're being heard at this meeting, at the Board of Selectmen's meeting, at town meeting, whatever meeting. If people walk out of a meeting and they feel like they've been ignored or patronized or um, just plain out not heard at all, not understood, that's one data point. That person is one data point. So the whole idea is that I would like to suggest that the NRC come up with some standards for evaluating, and there is a section there on evaluating, but it's about how many people visit the website, or how many people follow them on Facebook. This is not, this is not meaningful engagement. Public affairs people like to say, oh, we're so engaged. It's like, yep, yeah, yeah, we're not engaged. <laughs> we're not even going steady. <laughs> <laughs> Not even close. So that's the thing. And there's a spectrum of participation that, uh, uh, if you Google spectrum of participation, you'll see. It's not a, it's a, so what I'm trying to point out is the bottom line is that there is a standards development group at NRC, and they do stuff like, you know, measuring uh, radioactivity and so forth. There's also ways of measuring public, the meaningfulness of public value, the quality of public evaluation. People here tonight, as you've heard, have said, I don't feel like we're being listened to, so forth and so on. Would have been nice if there was an exit interview at all these 11 meetings that you've had to be able to compare and go, oh, look, over here, this one, they got 3.9, and this was 3.1 in Plymouth. What did they do over there? And compare it and so forth. So that's my suggestion. And uh, if anybody wants to talk to me later, I'll be happy to give them my card. Thanks. Th thank you very much. OK, so. Um, because we had a couple of cancellation and some people didn't use their, their full time, we actually have, um, it's only 8.20. So, let's start with this. Is there anyone who has not yet spoken tonight who would like to speak? Just raise your hand. Anyone? All right, going once, twice. All right. Is there anyone in the audience who has already spoken who would like to speak again? Okay. I have a question. Sure. Clarification. This, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, it said, uh, Steve Buckley again, uh, it says in the meeting announcement that I was printed off the website, it says category three meeting. Yes. How many, and I was saying there's different grades of participation. What, what is a category three and how, or how many categories are there? We've, we've been in the category meeting, but we don't know what grade grade we're in. <laughs> yeah, I'll just bring it. The NRC has a number of, of meetings, public meetings and non-public meetings. Uh, I think category one is a specific uh, meeting to discuss a specific uh, technical to topic with a licensee. We allow, I think, at that one, the uh, public to make comments after it, but not during it. Uh, category two is an uh, industry meeting, I think. I may get them confused because I don't do most of those. Uh, okay, I got it right? Okay. Is an industry meeting where we're listening and talking with industry about technical issues. And the, I think the public is allowed to comment at the end of that meeting too. Uh, category three means we're here to listen. And uh, so there may be something specifically that we're, we're here to listen about or get comments on such as a license termination plan or a, in the decommissioning world, a post-shutdown decommissioning activities report that's been submitted by the licensee for public to review and we want to hear their comments on it. So all we're here is a category three meeting. We're here to hear comments and, uh, and listen. And, uh, and with the sole purpose of this meeting is to formulate the comments so we can provide a report to the Congress on best practices. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, actually, your literature that's not consistent. It says right here, I'm reading verbatim. It says public participation, oh, this is a category three meeting. Public participation is actively sought for this meeting to 
fully engage the public in a discussion of regulatory issues. And that's what I was saying, is there's, there's public information meetings and there's public hearings, which is just a parade of, this is a public hearing, essentially. It's not a public discussion. I mean, if we were engaged in a discussion, it would resemble a discussion. So, and I'm not, I'm just pointing out that, that there are degrees of this, so if this is the top of the line, fully engaged in a conversation type of thing, then, and I appreciate you getting up and clarifying that, but that's the first thing this is probably the first time that I guess uh, members of the board of, or the panel have said anything, so watch out. There might be a discussion breaking out here right now. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm not, I'm not, just a little levity there, but I'm pointing out that that's what, there are degrees of public discussion, of a, a discussion, and I think, like I said, a lot of times the public affairs people get carried away with their, their buzzwords, so thanks. Thank, thank you. Janet Azarovitz from Falmouth on the Cape. I would like to know how much uh, you're going to be taking away comments about the CABs and our you know, discussion about CABs. How much of what the rest of the audience's questions are being noted and taken back to Washington? Yeah, promise? Every, so, promise? So every, where everything is being, I, I'll answer it this way, is that everything is being transcribed. They're all taking notes on everything that's being written. Um, everything you gave us, so the letter that, for example, Cape Winders, down, Downwinders gave us will be posted on the meeting website. So all of that, anything you hand to us, assuming that I can digitize it, will be put, or we might just take a picture of it if it's a three-dimensional object, and we'll put it up on the website. Granted, I've not been given any three-dimensional objects, but you get my point. Janet Azarovitz, A-Z-A-R-O-V-I-T-Z, -A -A out of habit. <laughs> Thank you. Jim Lampert from Pilgrim Watch again. And this is a slightly off tonight's topic, but it's a question I had raised with a couple of the NRC people here tonight and I think it's one that it's worth perhaps a number of us thinking about. As many, but obviously not all here know, the decommissioning trust fund is now owned by a Holtec subsidiary several steps down known as Holtec Pilgrim. Holtec Pilgrim in its PSDAR has said that it is going to enter a contract with a company called CDI to actually do the decommissioning work. CDI is a jointly owned joint venture between Holtec and SNC-Lavalin. It is not a licensee, and that's important because my understanding is that the NRC's authority pretty much ends with the licensee. Although it's not the licensee, it is the one that is actually going to receive about a billion dollars for the decommissioning work. My question is, does anyone at the NRC, is there a way for the NRC to frankly audit what is going on at CDI? Because how much CDI pays people and how much it basically reserves as profit that will be split between Holtec and SNC-Lavalin. And frankly, the agreements that exist with CDI, and I don't think anybody, I know I haven't seen them, I've tried to find them, and I don't know whether you've seen them or not, may well say that the quote, profit, close quote, and that profit is money that is not being spent to actually do the work. What is that profit? To whom is it being paid? What work is really being done? A Holtec rep told me that Holtec built profit into its expenses that showed up in the PSDR. My question is, who is keeping track of how that profit is realized? Okay. 
here. I'll try to keep this short. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we discussed this earlier. This is Bruce Swanson. Uh, briefly, you know, as you know, we're under litigation with on this particular issue, and quite frankly, I need my financial people here to answer that question. Uh, I did mention that we uh, we do uh, the NRC does require an annual report from the decommissioning company on the status of the funds. That's only the licensee, as I understand. Right, but it is the status of the funds, and that's also has to be coming from the trustee. The funds, funds are supposed to be used for decommissioning activities. We conduct inspections uh, as a matter of uh, every, very frequently during active decommissioning to ensure that it looks like the work is getting done as they've, as they've stated in their, in their reports. So unless we have a, a reasonable uh, point of interest in that the funds are not being spent properly, we do not go in and do an audit. Uh, and generally, that has been an, uh, a responsibility of the states to do through their public utility. Am commission. I correct so. that you have no authority to audit anyone like CDI? I think if we have the if we have an allegation of wrongdoing, I think we do. Okay. But basically, what's happening on the audit you get is that tells you how much money Holtec Pilgrim has paid to CDI based on invoices it received from CDI that will describe the work done to some extent. What it doesn't really tell you anything about is what were the real out-of-pocket costs to CDI and how much of it is simply going to Holtec, SNC, Lavalin profit. And I'm not at all clear that you have the authority to get into it since they're not a licensee. And I'm not asking to be told the answer to this. But it strikes me as something that the NRC needs very seriously to look at. Th thank you for that. Um, I just want to reach out again. Is there anyone who would like to, any, anyone at this point, um, whether you've spoken or not, whatever, um, who would like to, to speak in the time we have remaining? Anyone? All right, I'm going to, since we have time, I don't normally do this. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say something. Um, You've all heard why I come up here. You've heard me say it before, usually when I'm getting frustrated at you and I tell you I'm a volunteer. Um, but tonight, I want these, these meetings are particularly important to me for, for one reason. Um, and I'm speaking only on behalf of myself. And this is me in my best attempt to advocate for you. I'll keep it short, like two minutes. Is that I come from a Rust Belt town. I am old enough to remember the strike that ended it all. I remember watching my father stand at a picket line around a burn barrel um, while I drove by in my school bus. It's funny the things that get lodged in your head when you're a kid, like that memory. Remember I was wearing a gray tassel cap at the time and they had a little sign like honk if you support the union up. And I remember it was written in a whiteboard on red ink. Um, but then the factory closed and uh, what was there, the, the song of work of the, the echo of boots through the pedestrian tunnel under the railroad bridge to get to the factory, the sound of the shift whistle, the sound of the machines themselves was gone. And what we were left with was the song, if you will, of, of, of unwanted, untended idleness, of just sparrows and wrens flitting in a field of uh, overgrown weeds. And that's behind the chain link fence, and that's what's there now. And I don't know what opportunity the, ha the public had to comment or to the town had to have any say on what happened next. I was just a kid at the time, um, and I don't know what kind of records there are. But my point is this, is that many of you have said how frustrated you are with the NRC and not being heard, and how you don't think anything will come of this process, and how we're only here because we're required to be here. I, I'm not going to fight with you about any of those points. But my point is, is that um, you're being given an opportunity to have a say in what happens next. Maybe nothing comes of it. Maybe, maybe the Congress doesn't do anything at all. The, but okay, but my point is, is that you have a say. I'm, I don't want to argue with you. I don't want to argue with you. You did not give us the right to say something. We live in a democracy, and we are governed by the consent of the people. I, I, it's too late for you to say you're giving us permission to talk up here. I, I can't, I can only, I, look, I don't, I apologize. I don't want to get in an argument with you. I don't, that, my intent was not to aggravate you. My point was, look, you don't have to listen to me. You don't have to listen to me at all. I'm just telling you you have an opportunity that many other towns don't have. That's it. 
I, I'm not going to pretend that I can promise you that anything will come of this. I can't promise you that. I'm just saying that you have this chance and that I would recommend that you submit written comments. Again, I apologize. I'm not, I'm not in any way. Yeah. I meant to say that, and I, I apologize, let me, let me, mea culpa, I apologize. I meant to say in my remarks that, that what my situation is not a nuclear power plant shutting down. I am in no way saying that glass factory shutting down is the same thing as a nuclear power plant. And this has gone on way longer than I intended to, and I apologize, all right? I just want to ask that, you know, you have an opportunity, since we have some time the remaining, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Bruce to close the meeting. Again, I didn't mean to compare the two or suggest that they were the same. I apologize. Again, uh, thank you for coming out tonight. I have uh, a few summary comments. Uh, one is just in general for the NRC. Uh, it's, it, uh, you know, I heard clearly that the NRC should improve the policies and regulations. Specifically, the NRC needs to be, communicate better with the state and local communities and, and, that, uh, and the public. Uh, NRC needs to listen more and provide more time to allow for input from the states and the community advisory boards. Specific to CABs, uh, CABs or ND CAPs should be more independent and should pr be provided funding by the NRC or another government federal agency. CABs should have more local uh, representation that are voting members of the, of the CAB. CAB should be, required, should be required by the NRC, it should, and the NRC should attend each meeting to provide input. CABs in local communities should be provided with, uh, gotta read my, provided with uh, more educational and uh, informa site information. CAB should be uh, formally, be formed early, well before the plant is going to shut down and decommissioning is determined to enable the CAB to have input on the planning. And with that, I wanted to say special thanks to Sean uh, Mullen uh, for his help in getting this meeting together and, and, and having it here and his CAB for their input. And so uh, with that, I thank you all and good night.